Well, good morning, everyone. What a blessing to be here this morning with you. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Ed Sepanoski. I've been pastoring in the Calvary Chapel family of churches for over 30 years now, and I'm just blessed to be here. Bill gave me a call yesterday morning and said, hey, are you able to jump in the pulpit tomorrow morning? And I said, love to, love to. It's what I do. It's what I get to do now. I'm not pastoring a local church anymore, so I have some flexibility in my life and my schedule, and I'm just blessed to be here. Yesterday morning after Bill called me, I just started praying because, funny, when I first started about two and a half years ago when I turned over the local church and I started ministering to pastors and going out and guest speaking, I was somewhere, and, and a good friend of mine, one of the places I was teaching, she says, she comes up to me and she goes, so do you have canned messages you do everywhere you go? I'm like, no. How dare you? You know, it really is. And so I did start praying yesterday morning. I was praying, Lord, what do you have for the people in the coastlands that I could share with them from my heart, from your heart, Lord? What do you have for the people? And one word kept coming to my mind, shepherd. Because Jesus is our good shepherd. And we live in a world, on Thursday night I was able to jump in here as well, and you know, I was, I was teaching from the book of Colossians about just the preeminence of Jesus Christ. That in order to put off the old and to put on the new, we need Jesus. And we live in a world, and I think we w would all agree that we live in a world that needs Jesus. They don't need more politics. Jesus is the answer to politics, good and bad politics. Jesus is the answer to COVID. Jesus is the answer to cancer. Jesus is the answer to racism. Jesus is the answer to anyism. We need Jesus. And the world needs to see Jesus alive and living in his church. Because you don't go to church, you are the church. We are the body of Christ. We are the ones, one body, many members, and we all serve a purpose with each other. We all have a, a reason for existing. It's not just the pastors. It's not just the elders. It's not just the children's ministry workers. We thank God for them and for worship leaders and ushers and technicians, especially in these days when we need to be broadcasting. And we need us all, but we all have a purpose and a plan but the purpose and the plan, first and foremost, is to be submitting unto our Lord Jesus. When Jesus called the disciples, before he told them he was going to send them out, he said, I'm calling, he called them to be with Jesus. If we're not with Jesus, we have no Jesus to offer. And the world needs him. And so as I was praying and seeking, Lord, what do you have? Okay, you have this word shepherd. I'm going to be in a couple of passages, two main passages, but we're going to begin in the Gospel of John, the 10th chapter, and they're familiar passages, but I hope maybe we hear them in a little different way this morning about our need for the good shepherd, Jesus, and he is a good shepherd. We must never forget that, that it's not about what I can give. It's about Jesus flowing through me. And so John's gospel, the 10th chapter, beginning in verse 1, hear the word of the Lord. And it is Jesus speaking. And he says, most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Now Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and <coughs> will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal 
and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep, but a hireling is he who, does, who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I, am, and I know my sheep and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Therefore my Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment I have received from my Father. Therefore, there was a division again among the Jews because of these sayings. And many of them said, He is a demon and is mad. Why do you listen to him? Others said, These are not the words of one who has a de demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Father, we thank you for your word. Your word who became flesh and dwelt among us. Thank you for the incarnate word, Jesus, who is our good shepherd, who is the great shepherd, who is the I am. And Lord, we come to you today and we ask, Lord, that you would bring to life your word. Thank you, Lord, that it can go forth in the power of the Holy Spirit, but can also be received in the power of the Holy Spirit. May we take these words to heart that we might live for you in a world that so desperately needs you. In Jesus' name. Amen. When I think about Jesus as our good shepherd, as the great shepherd, I find such a peace. I find such a peace to know that we have one who cares for us, who loves us, who sought after us. We're those from the other fold that he spoke of in, in these words today because he was speaking to the Jews and they were those of the first part of the fold. I at least come from the Gentile. You may have Jewish background. I'm a Gentile as far as I know. We can't trace our genealogy back real far, but I'm a Gentile. And I'm part of that other fold. But there's one shepherd over both folds, and he's bringing us together. And in that new kingdom, we'll all be brought together in oneness. But today, in the body of Christ, we have many members, but one body, because there's one Lord, there's one spirit, there's one church, there's one God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we're called, you and I are called to live as that body. We're called to live as that body to bring Christ to the world. We're called not to look like the world, and I don't mean our physical appearance, not here to say we all need to dress a certain way or we need to look a certain way. We need to reflect the image of Christ. That's what we need to do. We need to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Savior, Jesus, that we would look like him because that's who the world needs. They don't need Ed. You don't need me to be speaking. You need God to speak through me. They need the love of Christ flowing through me to bring them unto salvation and that's why Jesus came. He makes that perfectly clear in this passage as one who is not the hireling, but the shepherd, the shepherd of the sheep. We're all a bunch of sheep. It's a matter of who our shepherd is. It's a matter of who our master is. See, we all want to be set free from slavery, don't we? But whether we know it or not, we're slaves to whoever we submit to. We never stop being a slave. We're either a slave to Jesus and righteousness or we're a slave to sin and Satan. There's not many races in the world, but there's two categories of people. We're all one race. Jesus died for us all, but there's two categories of people. Those who believe in him and are given the right to be called the children of God and those who do not believe in him and are therefore the sons of their father, the devil. And it is only when we're born again of the Spirit 
that we enter into the fold and Jesus can be our shepherd. He's seeking for us. He'll leave the 99 to go after the one. He did that for me. He did that for you if you've believed in him. He, the 99 are in good care by him. He's not stopping caring for the 99 when he goes after the one. But he went after you and he gave you worth and he gave you value because he's worthy. He loves you enough that he died for you and for you alone and for the rest of us who believe in him too. But he would have died for you alone. Why? Because you were separated. You were separated from God. The world is not any different today than it was in the days of Adam. There is two voices. Jesus makes it clear. There's two voices. There's his voice as the shepherd or the voice of wisdom as we read in Proverbs. But there's also the voice of the stranger or the seductress in the book of Proverbs. There are those two voices, and both voices stand on the walls of the city. They stand at the gates to the city. They stand crying out. Both voices are crying out. Well, there's been two voices since Adam. There was the voice of God who came to Adam after he created him, and he had created everything that was good for Adam. And he looked around, and he had Adam look around, and he said, look, every tree of the garden is good to look at. It's pleasing to the sight and it's good for food. And then he said, except for. See, God gave the good and said, Adam, listen to my voice and follow after the good, follow after me. But he said, except for one tree in the middle of the garden, that it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that second voice entered pretty quickly. And that second voice was deceptive. Why? Because he is all about stealing and killing and destroying. And he's been about that from the beginning. When he found out he couldn't be God, he wanted to destroy as many as possible. And he went into the garden and that voice was there. And Eve listened to that voice, that voice that said, did God really say? And that same voice is out there today saying, God didn't say that. God didn't mean this. God, yes, he did. He gave it to us. We know what it is. And that voice, we hear it. And ever since then, there's been those two voices and the world is going after the voice of destruction. But like we're told in the book of Proverbs, the voice of the seductress, oh, it sounds good. Come on, my husband's away. Let's enjoy a little time together. And then God says, they did not know what would cost them their life. And over and over again, as that seductress calls us to things that are pleasurable for a season, but lead to death, they do not know it leads to death. Jesus from the cross, what did he say? Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. They know not what they're doing. And yet they're following it. It's why we, we need to remember we're battling not against flesh and blood but against powers and principalities, the rulers of darkness in the heavenly places. That's who we're battling against. My battle's not against those who believe differently than I, who have a different morality than me. Oh, they're pawns. And God's called me for such a time as this. He's called you for such a time as this. You ever wonder why you're living in this day and not 2,000 years ago when Jesus walked the earth physically? Because God doesn't make mistakes. He put you here for such a time as this. He gave you your parents as good as they might be or as bad as they might be. The things in our life are all to draw us nearer to him. And we don't understand them all. I don't understand why my three and a half year old grandson is now with the Lord. I don't understand that. But I know God is good because he's a good shepherd. He's a great God and he loves me and he loves my grandson. I do know that Jesus wants us to hear his voice. He wants us to follow him and no one else. He wants us to take the sandals off our feet and deny ourselves and say, I have no rights. But Jesus, I'm going with you. And he tells us all about that. He says, there's all this deception going on. There are those who will lead to death. But he said, if you're my mind, you know my voice. Did you know my voice? You hear my voice. You obey my voice. 
You you come in through me. I'm the door. I'm the doorkeeper. And I'm the shepherd. Jesus is all in all. He said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. The world says all roads lead to God. You know, there's a partial truth in that. It's not a complete lie. But what happens when you get there? If you arrive before God without having believed in Jesus Christ, you get cast into the flame of fire for all eternity. There's always a partial truth, but watch for the full truth. When you listen to false prophets, don't listen to what they're saying. Sometimes you need to listen to what they're not saying. What they say sounds good, but they're not telling you the truth of how salvation comes. They're not calling repentance. They're not calling conversion. Without that, what does a prophet? What does it profit? And so Jesus says, you hear my voice. I have a voice that loves you. And I'm calling you in and I'm calling you to be with me so I can lead you out. Oh, how good it is to know I don't have to be a trailblazer. Some of you might like to be trailblazers. Some of you probably like camping a whole lot more than I do. And you like to be a trailblazer and to take that trail. Good for you. Let me know when it's clear and then I'll go. I don't want to be the trailblazer. I don't want the thorns and the thistle. I don't want to encounter things that aren't meant for me, you know? But Jesus isn't calling us to be trailblazers. He says, I will lead you out. I will take you by the hand. Proverbs 85, the last verse of Proverbs 85 says that he will make his footsteps our pathway as he leads us in righteousness. He will make his steps our pathway. I don't have to blaze a path. I just need to follow. What did he tell the disciples when he called every one of them? Come, follow me. And what did the disciples get wrong? They tried to lead him. Every day they tried to lead him, what did he say? Primarily to lead to Peter in that one time. Get behind me, Satan. Why? Because a good shepherd came for one reason and one reason only, to lay down his life, that he may take it again. See, he didn't just lay down his life. He took it up again, and he told them that was going to happen. That's what the good good shepherd does, because he owns the sheep. We've been bought with a price, not with bulls and, and, and goats, not with calves, not with sheep. We've been bought with the blood of the precious Lamb God, the precious Son of God, the precious Jesus, whom the Father sent, but whom Jesus will, willingly came. He willingly gave his life for me. I don't get it. I don't understand it. Why would anybody give their life for me? And you could put your own name in there. I don't have to say that to you. You know that. Why would he die for you? Because of love. He created you to be with him, to worship him for all eternity, but to be with him and to be one with him. And when we were separated, he said, "There's, there's no other way. If there was another way in that garden when he prayed, it would have been revealed. But there is no other way. But he would lay down his life. And he he would take it up again. That he would call us to be with him. And and he would lead us and he would guide us. And he said, I know, you know my voice. When I speak, you know, when I was in, (coughs) in the last year, I've seen a video. And I don't remember exactly when. But it was a tour group in Israel. You know, a group of people, I have no idea who they were. Thankfully, somebody recorded this, because this is wonderful. There's this bus that stops alongside a field of sheep, you know, and the shepherd's there, and they're talking, and they get off the bus, and they all get off the bus, and they're all standing along the fence, and the, 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 the tour guide is saying, go ahead, you, take a turn, call in the sheep. And one by one, about five of them are trying to call the sheep. Yo, sheep, sheep, and making all these noises, trying to call. The sheep didn't even pick their head up from eating across the whole field. The shepherd starts to make noises, sounds. They weren't even words. He started to make sounds, and one sheep picks up his head, and another one, and then another one. Next thing you know, one starts running, and they're all running because they heard the voice of the shepherd. They knew the shepherd's voice, and they knew how good their shepherd was to them. And Jesus said, you know my voice. You know my voice. Obey it. Listen to it. You don't need to lead. You don't know how, need to go ahead of me. 
I will lead you out. He calls his own sheep by name, verse 3 said, and leads them out. And where is he leading us? He's leading us out into the world. Why is he leading us out into the world? Because one of the major differences between Israel and the church has to do with location. You know, that's a great real estate thing. Location, location, location. Where was Israel? The same place it is today, at the crossroads of the east and the west. And the known world couldn't do any travel, couldn't do any, any commerce, couldn't do anything going east to west without going through Israel. They had to go through Israel. And God put his people there to introduce the pagans of the world to him. To himself. That's what Israel's purpose was for being there, that as they cross through, they might come to know the true and living God. But when Jesus gave the great commission to the disciples, he didn't say, stay where you are. He said, go into all the world. And that commission is still there for us. We're not in one location. We're across the globe so that we are bringing Christ to the people, not expecting them to come in here. It's great if you can introduce a friend. And if you're here today as a believer, Jesus, as an unbeliever, Jesus loves you. But I got to warn you, and I will give a warning. Apart from believing in Jesus Christ for your salvation, you are doomed. You're in big trouble. There is a hell. It's real. I don't care what the world says. But if you've been brought in here today, you've been brought in here because of the love of God that he wants you to hear the truth, that the truth might set you free. But if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, he's calling you to build one another up here. It's why we gather together for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry out there, so that you can take Jesus, you can be Jesus to the world. Isn't that a great statement in the book of Acts about the early disciples? Whenever they would speak with boldness and stuff, it would say the people knew they were with Jesus. Jesus was ascended but he was visible in the lives of his people. He was visible in the lives of his sheep, of his children, that he was leading them out. And we believe that God is leading us. We pray for divine appointments. You ever pray for a divine appointment? Oh, God, give me a divine appointment today. And then we go through the day. Maybe we see 50 people during the day and say, well, where was was the divine appointment? And God said, I gave you 50 of them. Every person you meet is a divine appointment. (laughs) There's no coincidence. There's no accident. Every person is a divine appointment. For what purpose? That we might allow Christ to be seen in us because they need him. And so he leads us out. He doesn't drive us out. The rancher drives the cattle. The shepherd leads the sheep. Jesus chose to identify with being a shepherd. And I'm the good shepherd. Better than any shepherd there ever is, you know? We don't understand that because, you know, as far as we're concerned, the shepherd is butcher and shop right. You know, I mean, that's that's what we think of. We don't understand the process of, of caring for sheep. But Jesus uses that to demonstrate to us his love, his love for people who need a shepherd. Sheep need shepherds. We need our shepherd. We need our Jesus. And he says, don't follow the voice of the stranger. When there's that check in the spirit, don't go with it. God lives in you, not just with you, but in you. He has chosen to do something differently with the church. He'll come back to Israel. He's not done with Israel. The church didn't replace Israel. As Jesus said, eventually there's going to be one fold. Those who come out of Israel, those who come out of not Israel. And there's going to be one fold. And he's the good shepherd. And and he's going to to, to work with them. But he's called us today to be light in darkness. He's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Into the light of his son, glory. We once were darkness. Now we are light. He's transformed us. That's what the gospel is about. It's about transformation. Transformation of the inner person. The outward's perishing. Day by day, it's perishing. And the outward includes the inward physical parts. But the inward, the spirit that's within us has been made new. And that's what can be renewed day by day in him. We become become more like him. He becomes more known to us. Oh, to know him more. 
As I get older, I realize how little I know of him, but even as he's revealing more of himself to me, I'm so thankful. I also know more of myself. I see myself for who I am. I know why Paul would say I'm the chief of sinners. I get it. I understand it. Oh, fighting against doing the things we know not to do. So we would do the things we're supposed to do. There's a battle going on. That's not a pre-conversion battle that Paul speaks of in my mind. That goes on daily. I'm in a war. I'm in a battle, not against my own flesh, though I need to keep it under control, but against the power that is trying to rule my flesh, to make that, that old man raise his ugly head again and again and again. And when he does, I confess and I repent before God, but also before whoever I let that ugly head rise up against. That's what makes us different. We're called to be different. And he is the shepherd. He gives life for us. And he's not asking you to give your life other than to him. If that means I perish here, so be it. Paul, the apostle, said, it's better to go to be, be with Jesus. But it's more needful for you that I remain here. You want to know why you're here today? Walk in this earth? Because it's more needful for somebody God has you here. And the day it's no longer needful is the day he'll call you home. We don't understand that. I don't get it. But I know that he said it's more needful for others that we're here. And a big part of the, the others are unsaved people. And so we're, 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 we're called to do that. And Jesus said the Father loves him because of what he's doing. In his prayer in John 17, he said, the world will know by our unity two things. One, that the Father sent the Son, greatest evangelistic tool there is. And the second thing is, the world know the Father loves us with the same love that he has for Jesus. By our love for one another, that's how they're going to know it. But imagine, could you, I, I, it's a mind blower. Jesus loves me as much, or the Father loves me as much as he loves the Son? Yeah, that's what the Word has. I walk around saying, I don't know, I don't get it. It's okay, God says, Ed, you don't have to get it because I have you. I'm the one who's, who's doing it. And I'm giving you my love. And as we look at this, this in, in John's gospel, I want to look at a psalm we're very, very familiar with, but now in the context of what we just read in John chapter 10. And it's Psalm 23, the shepherd psalm of David. But I want you to hear it now through the eyes of the New Testament. See, David didn't understand the Holy Spirit dwelling in him. David didn't understand that he was a forerunner, and from his lineage would come the Messiah. He didn't grasp what that Messiah was going to do. He didn't grasp the Messiah would die for us. Now we have that concept. We get that concept. We're living on this side of what Jesus has done for us. David lived on the, on the foresight of it and could only imagine what that means. But David writes these words, a Psalm of David, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you. And he turns from talking about him to God. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I dwell in the house of the Lord forever. As we put these, these two passages, an Old Testament passage with a New Testament passage, what a wonderful bringing together a, a, a picture of our God. 
that he wants us to know. He's revealing himself to us. And what we know of God is only what he reveals, but he wants us to know that. And he, and he wants us to have that mindset. It says, you, the Lord God, God Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, the one to whom I look, from whence comes my help, you are my shepherd. When you got the right master, you don't need to look for anyone else. We have the right master. We have the right shepherd. We have the great shepherd, the shepherd above all shepherds, the one to whom all other shepherds pale in comparison. You, God, you, Father, you, Jesus, you, Spirit, are my shepherd. I have nothing that I could ever want. I'm not going to lack anything. The I am that I am, that name that means I will provide every one of your needs, is my God and my shepherd. There's nothing I, I could need. My God shall supply all of my need according to the glory of his riches in Christ Jesus. Paul would tell us, I don't need anything except for you. you. There's some great worship songs out today. The old ones are great. Some of the new ones are great. But there's, uh, uh, I'm caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet. More than all that you can do, I just want you. Oh, that we would just want him. I shall not want. I have you, Jesus. What could I want for? You fulfill me. You fill all the need in me. And look at the first thing that he makes us to do in this psalm. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He makes me to rest. You tired today? Your good shepherd wants to make you lie down in green pastures with him. It's not that he makes you lie down and he disappears. He says, come, lie down in a green pasture with me. Lie down with me, Jesus is saying. Lie down. Lie down there with, with me. He leads me beside still waters. Still waters. Think of it. Think of what it means to be with the Lord in the presence of the Lord. As I think of, of the still waters, and I think of fire, and I think of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, to be in the fire with, with Jesus is so much better than being anywhere else. In his presence of fullness of joy, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, in that fire, and the king looks and he goes, didn't we throw three in there? There's a fourth one, like the Son of Man. He is the Son of Man. He's Jesus. He's with them in the fire. They got out of the fire, and they weren't scorched. I stand by a bonfire for two seconds, and I smell like it for day days. You got to take a shower to get it out of your hair. They came out, and they said they don't even have a stench about them. They're not scorched. Are we surprised? No, Isaiah tells us. He tells us, though the rivers might be rising, they will not overflow you. No water, water is going to overflow you. And though the fires may be there, you will not be burned. You will not be scorched. That's what Isaiah says. He leads us beside the still waters. Oh, they're pretty rough. But from, from Jesus' perspective, they're still because he's leading us there. He's leading us there. He restores my soul my soul, we were created as a three-part being. We were created with a, with a body, the physical aspect, sometimes called the flesh, but the flesh could also be talking about the worldly system. But we have a physical body, we have a soul, and we have a spirit. Sometimes only, I believe it's only twice, soul and spirit are used interchangeably. Everywhere else in the scripture, they're, sep they're separate. But we were born with the physical side of us. We all, whether we're born again of the Spirit, we all have a soul. It's our mind. It's our will. It's our emotions. Sometimes we call it our heart. But really, the heart reflects our mind, our will, and emotion. And all mankind who have been born since the fall, which means all births, were created to be a three-part being, but only two parts are alive. 
only the body is alive and the soul is alive. And until we're born again of the spirit, the spirit is not alive. And so he says, he restores my soul. He restores my mind. He restores my heart. He restores my, my emotions. When I'm with him, when I'm lying down in the green pasture with my shepherd, I am being restored in my soul. My spirit is, 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 is being revived, but so is my soul. I renew my mind. I re I'm transformed by the renewing of my mind. That's a part of my soul. I turn over my emotions to God, and I say, God, it hurts. And he says, yeah, I know. Let me comfort you. Let me take care of you. Let me lift you up. Let me be, be the lifter of your soul. That's who he is. He, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I already said Psalm 85. His footsteps are our pathway. He is righteous. He's leading us in righteousness for his name's sake. Oh, that we would understand everything that we do needs to have an order to it, that it would be God's will done in God's way, in, in God's time, in God's people, through God's Holy Spirit working in God's people for God's glory. All for God's glory, for his name's sake. Why did he save us? Because of his name. Because of his name. Not because, because we were better than anybody else. That's what he told Israel. Not that you were better, but because of my name. My name. And part of that name is mercy and grace. And that's why he extends it and he died on the cross. And though we go through, through the valley of the shadow of death, we don't go through death. We don't go through death as believers. We go through the shadow of death. It gives the outward appearance because the body dies, but the spirit is absent, present with the Lord. The spirit is present with the Lord. And so we go through the valley of the shadow of death. And in that valley... In that valley, and we all go in the valley, I will fear no evil. Oh, God, I got a healthy fear of you, and help us to have that healthy fear of you. But I will not fear man. I will not fear evil, because you didn't give me a spirit of fear, but you gave me a spirit of love, of power, love, and a sound mind. And your perfect love cast out all fear. I have nothing to be afraid of, because God will discipline me. That means he loves me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. In the middle of the valleys, when I have no fear, your rod and your staff, you're leading me and you're correcting me because you chastise and you correct those you love. That's why you correct your children. And if you don't, you're really not loving them because they need to learn. They need to learn those things and we need to learn. And God is doing it. And so I can, I can go through my days here. Why can I go through my days here with trials? Why can I go through with the pain of life, the physical pain, the emotional pain, the spiritual pain. Why? Because this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. And I'm not a vagabond. I'm not homeless. I just am not home. I'm not home yet. My home is in the, in the sky. And Jesus said he'd go to prepare a mansion. And I've heard a recent teaching, and I think there's a truth to it. I, I don't know if we're going to have physical mansions in, in the sky, but I, you know, the New Testament refers to this body that's perishing, this falling apart body, body as a tent. And we get a glorious body. And I think the glorious body is a part of that mansion. You know, I got a couple of replacement parts in this body. You know, but it's like, it's like putting new tires on a, on a 25-year-old used car. The rest of it's still old. You know, I'm looking for the glorious, glorified body, body, that mansion in the sky that he's leading us to. And if I have that mindset, this world is not my home, what can this world do to me? It's how our brothers and sisters who are martyred and being persecuted are able to live with what they're going through. Why could they live through what they're going through? This world ain't their home. What are they going to do? Kill me? Far better to go to be with Jesus. Now, I'll take an instantaneous, I'm, I'm not looking for the process of dying. <laughs> I don't look forward to that at all. I have no problem with dead, physically. The process I'm not looking forward to. But God will get through that. If he's going to have me go through things, it's, it's for his glory. Because some, somebody needs me. They need to see me depending upon God for my everything. You know? 
no longer trusting in myself. We know Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. We sing it, right? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He will direct your paths. And that's about as far as we get is singing it. Oh, Lord, I can't, my kid, my kid, oh, Lord, they're going down a path. Do you trust the Lord with all your heart? Oh, Lord, Lord, my business, I need to do this. If I don't do it this way, God, are you leaning on your own understanding? Oh, Lord, 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 are you acknowledging him in all your ways? I'm asking myself. I'm asking myself. He will direct my path. But I have to be a vessel who's willing to be directed. I have to be sitting at his feet. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemy. Oh, not only are we going to be blessed at the table, but they're going to know that we were right. They're going to know it. All we need to do is plant. All we need to do is water. God takes care of the rest of it. And he's good at it. He's really good at it. Because he's a good shepherd, but he's a better God. He's a better God. You anoint my head with oil. Now, if I don't wash my hair one day, I feel like by the end of the day, it's just oily. I want to take a shower and wash it. You know, that's what I think of oil on the head. That's not what it means. Oil in those days was a welcoming, soothing. And so it's like God saying, I'm soothing you, Ed, in the middle of whatever it is. Whatever it is, that, that oil flowing down over me of your Holy Spirit is going to soothe me. It's going to get through to me with goodness and mercy following me all the days of my life. His mercy is new every morning. Not yesterday's mercy, today's mercy. And that, uh, that's exciting to me. That's wonderful. As you start to grasp that, God, you got more mercy? What does that mean about the amount of mercy that God has that every morning he's giving every one of us new mercy? And he never runs out. He never runs out of mercy. He never runs out of grace. He never runs out of love. It doesn't mean he doesn't discipline. It doesn't mean there won't be judgment. But especially for those who are called by his name, look at what we get to dwell in. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Right now, he's chosen to dwell in us. He's dwelling in us. He's tabernacling in us. He's taking up, making his residence in us right now. His Holy Spirit dwells in us. But one day, we're going to dwell in his house, his presence. And we know, even on this side of eternity, in his presence is fullness of joy. I can't imagine what it's going to be like then. But that's part of the reason I have hope. Do you have hope today? Do you live in the reality of the hope that you have today? Because the hope that's within us is what's going to cause people to ask us why we have hope, which then we need to be prepared to give a defense for the reason for the hope that is within us with meekness and gentleness. But that verse says when they ask. Brothers and sisters, they should be asking us constantly. Why don't you have fear? What that's saying is, you got hope. How are you getting through this? What that's saying is, why do you have hope? They're supposed to be asking us. We say, what are we supposed to do? Where am I supposed to go? And God said, they're going to ask you. <laughs> they're going to ask you for the reason for the hope. If you live with that hope, that's the hope that we have. If you turn over to, to Matthew's gospel, I'm going to close with these scriptures <laughs> from Matthew chapter 11, beginning in verse 25. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent, have revealed, revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. What words of encouragement that is. What words of encouragement it is. God, you revealed it to me. I'm a babe. I don't get it. Oh, I thought I was wise. I had the wisdom of the world, but the wisdom of the world got me nowhere. 
It's only the wisdom from on high. And Lord, I thank you, you revealed it to, to me and to the other babes, God. It seemed good to you, God, to do that. It seemed good to you to reveal it to the foolish of the world, that they could confound the wise, to the weak, that they might baffle the strong. Oh, thank you, God, that it was good to you to do that. And in the process, thank you, Father. This is Jesus speaking to the Father about you. Thank you. You have given them to me because no one can snatch them out of our hand now. No one can take them away from us. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. That's what Jesus is saying to you right now. You got your doubts. You got your insecurities. You're looking at yourself. Get your eyes on me. We sang that song, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face. The things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And Jesus is saying, look at me, look to me, I'm the author. We're told to run the race with endurance, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher, the perfecter of our faith. We're told to do that. No one, and Jesus has chosen, chosen the Father's chosen to reveal himself to you. <laughs> what a privilege, not to be prideful about, but to be humbled by that God has chosen to reveal himself. And then these words from Jesus to you today, you know, in a world where it can be very tiring. It can be very tiring. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest can make you lie down in a green pasture. And then I'll lead you out. But I'm going to make you lie down in that green pasture. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus says, come, come unto me. Come unto me. Let me make you lie down in a green pasture. And here's what we're going to do when we're there. I'm going to take your burden that you're going to give to me. I'm going to take those things that are weighing you down. And I'm going to take them off of you. You can cast your cares upon me. You can cast your burdens upon me because I care for you. I'm going to take whatever's weighing you down because that's not from me. I've learned. I've learned that I tend to do a lot of things for God that God didn't ask me to. I, let me rephrase that. I try to do a lot of things for God that he hasn't asked me to do. And I find myself weary. And I'm crying out to God saying, God, I'm tired. Why? And he said, I didn't ask you to take that burden. I didn't ask you to do that job. I didn't ask you to minister to that person. I asked you to do this. And that would have been easy. Every time I find myself weary, doing good, it's because I'm doing the good somebody else is supposed to do. And God hasn't called us to do each other's good. He's called us to do good to each other. But he hasn't called me to do your role, and he hasn't called you to do my role. He's called us to be knit and fitted together. And when we have that yoke upon us, it's easy, it's light, because that's who Jesus is. That's who our Father is. He loves us. He loves us, and he wants us to sit at his feet. When Jesus called the disciples, the, the scriptures tell us, as he called the disciples, before he sent them out, the word says, he called them to be with Jesus. Some of you might be saying, I don't know my calling. Your first calling is to be with Jesus. And when you get that part in order, then he'll tell you what the next calling might be. But his first calling is be with me. I'll make you lie down in a green pasture because the world ain't going to give you a green pasture. I'll make you lie down in a green pasture. I'll restore your soul. I'll build you up. I'll be the one who's going to work in you. I don't have to work for God. I don't know if I said that this service because I say it everywhere I go. I don't know if I said that yet. One of the most freeing things for me as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ is to know I don't have to work for God. Almost sounds like blasphemy. No, I have to allow God to work through me. 
That's what he's called. He's at work in us both to will and to do for his good pleasure. And the more I understand that about my God, the better of a witness I can be. And you all can be witnesses out there because you all have a story with God. That line from Chosen in series one, I think it was episode four, but I was going in one way and now I'm going in another way. Mary Magdalene says it. And she says, and what happened in between was him. That's your story. You're going one way, now you're going another way, and what happened in between is him. It's Jesus. He happened in between, and he wants to take us. He's not only the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. He's everything in between. He's everything in between, and he's taking us. And he's taking us, and he'll take you on a journey with him that is going to be mind-blowing if you let him. When you let him when you let him lead. He's very good at it. When I let him lead, I find myself pretty satisfied. When I find myself leading, and I do often, I'm like, what? Oh, sorry, God. It says, those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. Those who wait upon the Lord shall mount up on wings like eagles. Those who wait upon the, the Lord shall run and not grow weary. Those who wait upon the Lord shall walk and not faint. The key is, how are you waiting? How you wait is important. If you're grumbling and complaining and you're waiting, you're not really waiting. When you learn to be content in every circumstance, then you're waiting. And when you wait upon the Lord, be prepared to fly. Be prepared to soar. That someone looks at you and says, how are you soaring? How are you flying in a world that has everybody so burdened and laden down, they're afraid to come out of their houses? I'm able to do what I can do through Christ who strengthens me. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are the best shepherd of all, that you are a good shepherd, and that you love your sheep, and that you lead your sheep. Thank you, God, for Jesus, for his obedience even to death. Thank you that there is salvation in the name of Jesus Christ. And Lord, thank you that you've chosen to save us. May we go forth from this place, Lord, with a renewed, restored soul, with a greater vision of you, with a greater love for you, with a greater understanding that it's not by my might, not by my power, but by your spirit, says the Lord of hosts. So God, just go before us today. Pour out your spirit, God, that we might live for you in a world that needs Jesus. Until you come, Lord, may we be about our Father's business. All for your glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.